Hello everybody and welcome back for another virtual proteomics lecture. So in the previous set of virtual lectures that you looked at before, we talked about things like uh, some of the fundamentals behind how proteins are made, the fact that they're made up of amino acids. We talked about classes of amino acids. We talked about the ways in which proteins fold. So what we want to do in this first part of this lecture is we want to have a little bit more of an in-depth discussion on protein folding. Not necessarily talking about specific things like the formation of secondary structures like alpha helices and beta sheets or anything like that. We want to talk about some maybe big picture stuff with protein folding. So let's go ahead and get after it here. So in the previous lecture we established that proteins once they have been synthesized by the ribosome they have to go through the typical hierarchy of protein folding going from a primary structure to a secondary structure uh, setup uh, and then eventually into tertiary folding so that the protein can assume its final three-dimensional configuration. And as we said, having this three-dimensional shape is absolutely necessary for a protein to function. Now, the thing that we have to remember here, and we talked about this plenty last time, is that folding is really all about the protein or the amino acid side chains especially when you talk about tertiary folding so we want those side chains regardless of whether they are hydrophobic or polar or acidic or basic or whatever they happen to be uh, the protein is going to fold in such a way that we try to satisfy the chemical requirements of as many of those side chains as possible so if we look at this in a thermodynamic sense, when a protein is unfolded, it exists in a very high energy state, meaning its Gibbs free energy would be relatively high. It would be a positive number. The folding process is going to progressively take the protein down to a more low energy state so that we can get that delta G number to get down into the negative. Now, something that we had talked about is the limited rotational freedom about a polypeptide backbone. So uh, atoms cannot rotate about that peptide bond, but there were two other uh, chemical bonds for each residue in the, in the protein that allow for some rotational freedom. And uh, basically, if you do a little bit of quick math, uh, it ends up for each amino acid residue, there should be eight different kinds of bond angles that that particular residue can assume as the protein folds, meaning that we can rotate each atom in a particular way, and for each amino acid residue that makes up the protein, we can do it eight different ways. So to do a little bit more math here, if a protein contains a number of amino acid residues that is equal to N, where N is any whole number, then the protein should be able to fold into 8 to the nth power different configurations. So if we assume that we have a protein that contains 100 amino acids, and that's actually relatively short for a protein, then that protein could fold in 2 to the uh, 10 to the 90th different ways. So 8 to the 100th power is the same as 2 to the uh, 2 times 10 to the 90th power. So that is an absolutely huge number. So practically almost an infinite number of ways that a protein that is 100 or more amino acids can fold. So the question I guess we want to address here is if there are almost an infinite number of possible ways that a protein can fold, how is it that we end up on just one correct configuration that a protein will land on? So what we want to talk about here is an experiment from a gentleman uh, that worked at the National Institutes of Health. His name was Christian Anfinson, and the experiment that we're about to look at here won him and his colleagues the Nobel Prize, which is very important, obviously. Uh, so what he showed, he was working on a protein, or rather an enzyme, called ribonuclease A, a relatively small protein. And what he did is he took this protein and he treated it with very harsh chemicals to both denature the protein and to reduce it so that there are no disulfide bonds. Uh, eight molar urea was sufficient to denature the protein and a chemical we're going to become more familiar with later in the semester called beta-mercaptoethanol, or BME, was able to reduce all of the disulfide bonds, uh, meaning that all the cysteine residues exist as free sulfhydryl groups. So 
basically we denature the protein. We get the protein to completely unfold itself so that it should no longer have any function. So what he then did is he took this solution of ribonuclease A that has been denatured in urea and BME, and he removed those denaturants and reductants by dialysis. We talked about dialysis before. It's a way to remove molecules from a solution while keeping the proteins inside of the dialysis bag. So he removed the urea and the BME, took it out of the solution, and what he then allowed for is he allowed for the proteins to take some time to try to refold back into their proper configuration. And it turns out that a lot of the proteins were able to do so. So after we took out these nasty, harsh chemicals, the proteins were able to fold into their native states or correct configurations if given enough time. So the most important conclusion from this experiment was that the only thing that is necessary or sufficient in order to get a protein to fold into its correct configuration is the primary sequence of the protein. It's enough for the protein to exist in its primary configuration. You shouldn't, in theory, need anything else for the protein to just find a way to get itself into its correct shape. Nothing else is really needed. Now, here's the rub. If a protein were to fold simply by sampling every possible configuration, right? So we talked about all those almost infinite number of possible configurations. If a protein were to, by trial and error, sample all of those possible configurations until it finds the right one, it would take uh, approximately 1 times 10 to the 27th years to find that configuration. Now, that's longer than the age of the universe. So, this must mean that this isn't quite the way that proteins fold. So, what's actually happening here is that as a protein folds, it kind of starts to figure out what works. So, as we start to form secondary structures like alpha helices and beta sheets, the protein quickly figures out that, okay, these are good, stable conformations and we need to uh, hold on to these. We need to maintain these. So as the protein keep, continues to fold, we drastically cut down on the number of incorrect configurations that are possible by maintaining our secondary structures into what we call a molten globule state. And then it becomes much easier and much quicker to eventually get into the native correct configuration later on. So it shouldn't take years and years and years and years to fold. It should happen much quicker than that. And that is consistent with what Christian Anfinson found in his ribonuclease A experiment. Now, the results of Anfinson's experiment obviously very, very interesting, and it gave us a lot of important information. But here's the thing. The ribonuclease A enzyme that was in his dialysis bag, some of the proteins did fold back into their native configuration, but the reality is that not all of them did. In fact, the majority of those denatured proteins are going to stay denatured for a while. It's actually only a, a fairly small fraction of them were able to refold themselves within minutes. Now, keep in mind, Anfinson's experiment was all done in vitro, meaning it was done outside of the cell. It was done in laboratory equipment or test tubes or whatever. So in the cell where proteins are actually uh, synthesized and folded and functioning, proteins need to be able to fold very, very, very quickly. Cells cannot afford to waste any time or any energy on making proteins that are not functional right away. So as soon as a protein is synthesized, it needs to fold into its native state and get working right away. Otherwise, we're dealing with a huge waste of time and energy on proteins that are not, not likely to ever become functional. So the fact that cells can get proteins folded and functional almost immediately after they are made likely is due to a new class of proteins we're going to talk about next called chaperones. So it turns out that a chaperone is actually a protein itself. So that leads to kind of an interesting chicken and egg discussion that we could have some other time about, okay, how did it get folded? But we'll, like I said, we'll save that for another time. A chaperone is a protein that assists other proteins in the folding process. It turns out that a lot of chaperones actually live or exist pretty close by to ribosomes, uh, 
so that they can actually co-translationally fold polypeptides as they are being made by the ribosome. So this helps to explain why a lot of proteins get folded almost right away, even if the ribosome is not quite done folding them or not quite done making them. So you can see we have a ribosome here and you can see the nascent polypeptide being synthesized. And even though the ribosome is still attaching the last few amino acids, these uh, chaperones here called HSP70 are already glommed onto the protein and are already assisting in folding it into its native state. So we talked about the fact that there's a nearly infinite number of possible folded shapes for, that a given protein can assume, assuming it's uh, 100 amino acids or more. So like I said, the cell really can't afford to wait for the protein to just find its best configuration by random chance. The best configuration that we are after, and I've referenced it in the previous slides, is called the protein's native state. What the chaperone does is it greatly accelerates protein folding by making impossible the vast majority of those non-native state or incorrect protein configurations, meaning that as the protein continues to fold, we ensure that it really cannot make too many mistakes and the correct answer or the native state becomes a much more obvious uh, configuration for the protein to assume. Therefore, we're able to get the correct shape for the protein in a much smaller amount of time. And then what you might have noticed on the previous figure is that uh, a lot of protein folding requires the uh, molecule ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. ATP is a very high energy molecule and the pr process of folding a protein actually does require energy. And for that reason, a lot of chaperones are classified as ATPase enzymes, meaning they require the hydrolysis of ATP in order to do their job. So one of the last questions that we want to address in this section is what draws a chaperone to an unfolded protein? What's the attraction there? What is it about chaperones that allows them to do their job? Well, to answer this question, we need to think about what a protein that has not folded correctly is actually doing. So the major driving force behind protein folding is going to be those hydrophobic side chains that we've referenced before. The major driving force for folding a protein is to make sure that those hydrophobic side chains do not have to interact with any water. So the biggest drop in energy that we see as a protein folds is getting those hydrophobic side chains buried at the interior of the protein. We call those hydrophobic interactions and we've talked about it before. So. If a protein is not folded correctly, it stands to reason that a lot of these hydrophobic side chains are actually temporarily exposed to the outside aqueous environment that surrounds the protein and encapsulates the cell. So what a chaperone is going to do, again, we call some of these uh, chaperones heat shock proteins because heat represents a very common way of denaturing proteins. A lot of these chaperones will actually bind to these hydrophobic patches of side chains, temporarily cover them up and shield them away from water, and then assist the protein as it tries to fold and hide those hydrophobic side chains away. Now, chaperones are not uh, totally uh, infallible. They're not totally uh, able to fold every kind of protein. Sometimes we may encounter situations where a chaperone cannot fold a protein in a quick or energy efficient manner. So a lot of times what the cell will instead do is give up on that protein, say, okay, it's never going to fold correctly. And the cell may choose to instead destroy that protein so that that unfolded protein doesn't cause the cell any problems later on. So we'll have more to say about that in a later section. Okay, so that's going to do it for this first part of this lecture on the role of chaperones in protein folding. Uh, so I will see you next time and we will start talking about a slightly different subject matter, uh, the different ways that proteins, after they have already been translated, that they can be chemically modified, uh, which can oftentimes change their function. So thanks for your attention and I will see you in the next video. So long.